We're going to be talking about building open source communities today. Um, so quick, who am I? Uh, my name is Tierney Siren. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I am a senior cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. Uh, and I'm a collaborator on various parts of the Node.js project. Um, I am chairperson of the community committee, help out with various initiatives there, uh, and also collaborator on a few working groups. So what is open source community? Open source community is everything beyond the code. Uh, this includes things like people, process, location, coordination, funding, social media, blogging, diversity, inclusivity, outreach, moderation, policies, events, documentation, licensing, and a bunch of other things. It's a lot. Um, and it's something we kind of trivialize in open source because code is what we can really measure easily. But every community has its own focuses and needs, and non-code needs will always exist. Um, and therefore, kind of community needs will open, always exist. Um, so I ask every event, uh, what is open source community? Um, and these are some responses that I've gotten over time. Um, and, you know, mm, they may not be super readable, but uh, each of these kind of says something different. Uh, everyone has their own take on it because they all have their own experience. They all come from a different background. And you know, the TLDR is that there is no actual consensus on what this means, but the theme that I've seen throughout all of these things is that everyone agrees it's not code, or not necessarily code. Code might be an element, but it's all the things that surround the actual goal of an open source project. So um, nevertheless, we end up uh, building up open source communities, and some of them end up thriving, and some of them end up dying off. Um, how do you actually come about uh, a successful and thriving open source community? The answer to that question is difficult, and it's not single-threaded, right? There's multiple approaches you can take to get to that point. Every ecosystem has its different approaches, so something uh, that would work for a JavaScript community and JavaScript ecosystem might not work for a .NET or a Ruby or a Java or a Go ecosystem uh, project. Luckily, um, there are some fundamental underlying traits that, at least in my experience, are shared across different open source projects uh, that end up being successful to varying degrees. In this talk, I'm going to be going a bit over my experience um, in open source and the things I've seen that have led to success and some of the things I've seen that haven't led to success. Um, and those are often very closely tied in that someone or some community does something that is successful, whereas others may drop that and that kind of loses steam or, or slows them down a bit. So I've been in open source for seven years. Um, I started um, from uh, you know, wanting to build a forum for uh, a private server for RuneScape. Uh, but uh, in that time, I've started working with, or I've been, had the chance to work with a lot of people, um, and I've had the chance to work with a lot of technologies. Um, I started a bit with Java and failed horribly, um, and then went to PHP and had a bit more success, and then kind of a little bit of Ruby and CoffeeScript, and again, didn't do too well, um, but uh, you know, JavaScript and Node ended up being something that I've had a lot of success with. Uh, but along the way, I've been able to learn a lot from each of those communities and each of those ecosystems. And from that experience, I'm gonna be sharing a little bit of my, the lessons I've learned from each of those communities and each of those things um, to help kind of try to share some of the overarching uh, lessons that can be kind of seen as success or leading to success from each of them. So these are the projects that I've been involved in in some non-trivial manner. Um, so MyBB is a PHP forum system. Uh, it's based on PHP and the framework. Uh, Tent was a decentralized uh, protocol that was basically for sharing data that you could build social networks and things on top of. Um, that was mostly Ruby and CoffeeScript. Uh, IOJS is, was a fork of Node, I guess still is technically, but was a fork of Node, mostly C++ and JavaScript, and then Node is itself uh, mostly C++ and JavaScript. So let's get into the lessons. Lesson one is don't build too much. Um, when you build out too much structure around a community before it exists, uh, it dampens growth and natural interaction. So this is something I learned a bunch uh, throughout 
over, over time and over the different projects I participated in. Particularly though, maybe a node or two that I, I really acutely felt this. And what I've learned is it really limits what you can do in terms of natural growth because projected growth or something you want to see or the way you want to see your community grow will never be how that community actually grows or very, very rarely. Um, and so building out structure for how your community should grow limits the, the branches it can have and the, the ways it can actually grow. So um, from my BB, I learned that creating too much space, too much structure can actually make a community look empty, completely empty. Um, my first project, like my first thing that I owned was uh, a forum called Technoboard, uh, technoboard.net. I don't think anyone's re-registered the domain, so feel free to if you want. Um, but I created a, a ton of forums. Um, I emulated the structure I was seeing in other successful forums because I thought they were successful and this is how they're doing it, so this is how I should do it. Um, it turns out that success and that structure was um, a result of their natural growth and the overflow of people wanting to talk about X, Y, Z, um, for example, like uh, blockchain, I guess. Um, talking about, you know, I want to talk about blockchain now that blockchain is a thing. Um, I don't, but they did. Um, so the admins of that forum would go create a forum for that so people could go have that discussion. Um, it turns out if you start, that, start doing that from the very beginning, it doesn't work out too well, um, and you just create a bunch of empty space that people see there's nothing here, and I'd, why would I want to contribute to this when there's no activity? Even if there is activity, creating out and mocking a bunch of space doesn't actually lend to a successful community. Um, now, I'm gonna talk a bit about Node. Um, sometimes when you're in Node, it, submitting a PR can feel a little bit like this. Um, we have a lot of processes in place in certain areas of the project uh, for very good reasons. We are releasing software that is massively impactful and that is very important to a lot of people. Um, and it's, we wanna make sure everyone here that your experience is good. And so we have processes that sometimes feel a little bit like this because we want to make sure we're releasing something without issue. Um, that said, the process can feel a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, so too much red tape can limit growth. Um, sometimes it is necessary when you're working on something that's very, very important. Um, but I tried emulating that red tape that I saw in other areas of the project when I started uh, becoming involved uh, in the community committee. So James Snell, at the beginning of last year, uh, introduced me to the community committee. He helped me get involved. And he, you know, I begun kind of doing what I, mimicking the things I've seen in other areas of the project. That uh, was not necessarily the best thing for the community committee because this is when we were getting started and I was trying to introduce more red tape. That red tape wasn't actually gonna be helpful because it wasn't needed in this context, that was useless in this context, but I was trying to mimic the success I'd seen in other areas that needed that red tape. Um, and I, my peers quickly said, you know, this probably isn't useful, this probably isn't necessary right now. It might be in the future, but it's not right now. Um, and that really kind of helped me see that it is useful sometimes to have that red tape, but additionally, uh, this was the exact same thing that I had done with Technoboard, which was um, building out unnecessary scaffolding that would inhibit the growth rather than actually encourage it. So, next thing is empowering contributors. Uh, without contributors being empowered, you're not gonna get very far. There's not an incentive for them to stick around if they don't actually feel some kind of meaning or some kind of um, value, that they're actually adding value to this project. Um, and additionally, enabling contributors enables contributors to enable contributors. So, by lifting one person up, or two people up, or five or 10 people up yourself, uh, and making sure that they feel welcome and that they can find success, you're actually helping them, you're kind of uh, helping grow them so then they can do the same in the future, which becomes a tree or, wow, that sounds like a pyramid scheme. Um, <laughs> but uh, it basically helps you grow your community by enabling others, which will then help them enable others. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really important thing to do is you need to be focusing on people rather than product or people rather than code um, because that's how you can actually grow, tangibly grow an open source project. 
Um, so an example of this is in the evangelism working group. Uh, this was in both IOJS and Node.js. Um, I helped create it with Michael Rogers when it was in IOJS and then it can carried over into to Node.js. Um, we had a pretty tremendous scope, but we didn't really have the resources or ability to do what we needed to do. And the context of that is um, we, were, we were a working group that needed to, that was a bit different than any other working group. Most working groups are focused on code or specific processes that are related to code. Um, the evangelism working group was more about community and helping folks grow and growing our community. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge because we were still under all of the similar, the same things that, uh, that the technical kind of uh, focused groups were, were operating under. And we didn't have the ability to actually go do some of the things because we still had to go ask permission um, to be able to do that. We weren't really empowered in the ways we needed to be. Um, and there were times where it definitely felt like we were a little bit like Oliver Twist here. Um, and it wasn't necessarily intentional on the part of the people we were asking, but it did feel like this a bit sometimes. Um, so once individuals are actually empowered, they can begin to work to grow the community. Um, so eventually in Node, we got to this, um, where we were able to create the community committee, as I talked about a little bit before, um, which is a top level committee. So instead of being a, a working group of the technical steering committee, we actually had a peer to this technical steering committee. Um, and we're a, it turned out that that uh, being a peer rather than uh, you know, under it, uh, under the TSC, enabled us to be a little bit more loose in how we were able to define our own work. And that enabled us to be a little bit more successful uh, along the way. And that was super empowering for us as a committee and as a group of people who cared about the community and also um, as a uh, you know, independent entity uh, in the project itself. So the next one is accepting help along the way. Um, owning an open source community is a great way to become overwhelmed. Uh, it's a great way to be super frustrated, and it's a great way to burn out. Um, so you can't really own an open source community. Um, and this does definitely tie into own, uh, to accepting help because if you're an owner, you are taking ultimate responsibility for this project, this community, this ecosystem. Um, so an example from this is Tent. Uh, their intent was to, intent, uh, their intent was to be perfect at 1.0. They wanted to ship 1.0 and be done. They never have to change it ever again. Uh, their example was HTTP, which Turns out it has not really played out too well as an example uh, with you know, HTTP 2 and HTTP 3 coming. Um, but yeah, their intent was to be perfect with 1.0. There was three people working on it, and they wouldn't really accept community contributions, at least not meaningful community contributions. They'd accept tiny PRs that were fixes, but they wouldn't actually accept uh, direction or help or influence from the community because they, they knew they needed to, they, they thought they knew they needed to have it perfect at 1.0. Um, and it was in their heads, not the communities or the ecosystems. Um, and as such, because they were focusing on it in this way, they weren't actually able to help their community uh, in the ways that it needed, in the ways that it, uh, issues were manifesting uh, and problems with the protocol. They weren't actually able to address those because they were focused on their vision, not what the community needed. Um, and sometimes, you know, understanding your, your tool and your product is fine. Um, but it's still incredibly valuable to actually be listening to the users of it because they're the ones who are actually experiencing the pain. And we'll get a bit more into that later. But they ended up a bit like this. Uh, they needed to own the protocol, it was theirs, and they were gonna drive it to success rather than us driving it to success. At certain scales, communities can begin to outgrow those who are leading them. Um, the, the node is a pretty good example of this. Uh, we've had three BDFLs. Um, this was when the project was Joyance. Um, and they were able to drive a lot. They did a lot of good. Um, there were road bumps for sure, but they drove the project and they did as good of a job as I, at least I could expect from anyone. Um, and again, Node was intended to be perfect with 1.0, which this seems to be a, a common theme. Um, so, you know, at some point, Node got to a, a point where it needed to kind of not be just under one person or one company, 
and it had to kind of have a little bit more direction and more people working on it because so many people actually depended on it and actually relied on it. And at that point, Node kind of outgrew the ownership model or the BDFL model. Um, now, Node now follows a community-centric model where it focuses on enabling um, success. Uh, so we focus on enabling individual contributors to succeed uh, and just come and contribute. Uh, there's no central direction. Uh, we don't have um, you know, a roadmap of what we're planning, largely because we found that doesn't necessarily work. And also some things like modules, despite us you know, wanting to ship it before, unflagged before 12, it shipped yesterday, three weeks later, um, or two weeks later. Um, flagged, or unflagged. So we just missed this deadline despite us really wanting to ship it in this, in 12 unflagged, 12 LTS unflagged. Um, and there's very good reasons for us kind of following this community-centric model because we don't know what contributions are gonna be coming. Uh, we, there's individuals who spend time on contributions a lot, but it's not necessarily something we can fully plan. And I think that's a lot healthier of an approach, uh, at least for a larger project, because it, um, it allows us to be a little bit more flexible in how we approach things and not burn people out. So in my personal experience, um, I got started via small contributions. Uh, Michael Rogers, uh, who, he wrote a blog post uh, at one point that was basically saying, you know, IOJS 1.0 shipped, we would love to kind of um, get people contributing. Uh, and this was, you know, right during the fork, uh, and they had just shipped 1.0. And one of the key things in that kind of blog post was that they wanted non-technical contributions. This was a time when I didn't really have trust in my technical abilities at all. And I wanted to be able to contribute still, so I came, in, I came and did that. Um, and I was able to contribute non-technically, and then I was able to continue contributing and continue contributing, and I was able to grow my contributions, and then I got a job from those contributions, which is atypical and very lucky, but I, you know, was able to do that. Um, and then I was able to continue contributing because of that job. Um, and that kind of tiny decision uh, of me coming to contribute and Michael asserting that non-technical contributions were welcome was very important to me. So now I'm involved in, very, in the Node project in various ways and that's largely because of the current structure of how Node works. And when the community leads, you're able to work together toward the same goals, even if you don't know what those goals are today or tomorrow, you're still able, gonna be able to work on them uh, in the long run. Uh, and you're able to stay on track and course correct when necessary and kind of lean on each other when you're not able to work, when you're not able to come in and participate. So lesson four, uh, communicate effectively. Poor communication leads to sadness. Like, it's super frustrating when you're not able to communicate with your peers effectively, with the people that are working in a project effectively. But like, how can you actually communicate effectively? The way I found to communicate, effectively at least, is to go where different people are. So some folks I know prefer Slack DMs. Some prefer Twitter DMs. Some prefer emails, which I humor them. I'm, I'm not a fan of email myself. Um, but uh, some folks prefer Slack. Uh, some po folks prefer Discord. Some uh, folks in Europe prefer WhatsApp. Um, the thing I found to be successful in this area is to go where people are and not be picky myself, even though I prefer, I prefer Twitter DMs. Um, that doesn't mean everyone does. And so being more dynamic and being willing to be flexible there enables me to be able to communicate with folks much better. And that's generally one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there, you know, having some kind of central discussion medium is important. So in, in terms of, you know, Node, we use GitHub for that. But, you know, you will need to eventually talk to people one-on-one -on -one or privately or whatever. And being flexible in that way is super, super important. Um, and, you know, I, started doing this kind of unintentionally without thinking uh, when I was in IOJS because I was super like scared. I didn't really know how to effectively communicate with folks uh, and so I reached out to them privately wherever I saw them existing. Um, and that ended up working really well and I've been able to kind of carry that uh, through over time. 
So the thing here is ensuring you're communicating with people on as many channels as possible. This helps engage everyone. Um, it does not, it, it helps reduce bias in terms of communication uh, and it helps uh, build out trust, consensus and awareness of your project and also um, different challenges that people may be facing in terms of communication. Um, so throwing different approaches at, wall, at the wall and seeing what sticks is actually a really good way to be able to communicate effectively. In Node, we've learned that we can't really have a single suggested platform outside of GitHub. Um, this is discussion, we've had these discussions for multiple years, I think at this point, five years. Um, and this discourse has kind of burned people out. Um, there are several people I know who don't participate in the project anymore because of the discussion around what mediums can we use outside of uh, GitHub to actually have communication and effective, like, real-time communication. Um, and because of the, those discussions, we've basically just kind of settled on GitHub is our official thing. A few people use IRC. Um, but outside of that, there's no real centralized communication. And, you know, in Node, we each have a kind of tool belt of different ways to communicate. So Twitter DMs, IRC, Slack, email, uh, Discord, like various things that we can use. And at least I find that people are pretty respectful of those different ways and communicating with you on the platform that you're comfortable. And this communicates, helps us communicate with everyone where they're, where they're comfortable. So, lesson five, be humble. This one is super, super, super important. All of the other lessons kind of tie into this in some way, right? Um, in terms of communication, be humble in your own uh, communication style and letting other folks, uh, you know, communicate how they want to. That's one example. Um, it's a fundamental requirement when you're contributing to open source and building a community. You're never going to get it right. You, as an individual, will never get things right 100% uh, of the time. So being humble, be listening, and being willing to accept help uh, is super, super, super important. And most successful communities I see are saturated with folks who are humble. Um, and also folks who are willing to recognize when, who, who are typically humble, but are willing to recognize when they're not being humble. Being arrogant in open source only enables tribalism and elitism. Um, we have a lot of kind of jokes in the JavaScript community about this, you know, um, especially around frameworks and front-end frameworks and things like that. And there is some tribalism there, and there is some elitism there. Um, and that is one of the challenges that we do end up facing in open source. Um, one place that this kind of manifested for me was Tent, where as much as I liked them, uh, the, the three people working on it, they were super nice. I've now met them. Um, you know, I was doing this work when I was in high school-ish. And, um, you know, that, that was a challenge because I didn't have ability to go see folks despite them meeting each other. But at this point, I, like, validated that I liked them as humans. Um, but they were a little bit arrogant in their approach to this project and to this community and to this open source ecosystem. That ultimately led to the project's demise, that arrogance and not being humble and not being willing to listen to how their community uh, perceives success and perceives uh, issues in the projects. And being humble allowed for the community, or being humble would have allowed for the community to succeed in the long run, or at least longer than it did, uh, which would have given it a lot more of a chance, uh, you know, outside of the two years that it re was really actually worked on. So, um, open source isn't about driving, it's about enabling people. Um, we've not, we've not successfully communicated this often enough. People see this as a way to become a rock star, and being a rock star is the worst possible thing in this, this org, uh, or this industry. Um, it is the antithesis of being humble, and we have tried this so many times. Um, there have been a few examples where a BDFL has actually been successful in terms of like being a master. Um, and, you know, I think Python was relatively successful with a BDFL, um, but that BDFL is no longer a BDFL. Um, Node has had BDFLs. We no longer have BDFLs. Tent had BDFLs, no longer has BDFLs. 
there's kind of a pattern that at least I've seen in open source and in my engagements in open source that not following this path of being a master, being a rock star, but being a steward is the way to find success um, in a, an open source community. Node gained enough momentum that it couldn't reasonably ma be managed by a single person, as have many other projects. It needed folks who could be empathetic toward all of its users, um, or as many as possible, as many as reasonable. And those users are worldwide. You know, I spend all, most of my time in the US, but I'm here in Europe talking to y'all, and I've learned a bunch of very interesting uses that y'all use Node for. Um, so it's not reasonable for a single person to be idolized and put up on a, a podium, which, um, yeah, it's not, it's not reasonable for, for an individual, one human, to own this. Uh, we need stewards. So this is a GIF of New York. Uh, there's often a bunch of thing, not great things on the sidewalks of New York. Once uh, I was wearing my most expensive shoes that my wife had given me, I convinced her to give them to me rather than to sell them. Um, and about a, I left the office and about a block, of way, a block away from the office, I slipped in a pool of vomit. Completely ruined the shoes. I had a 40 minute trip back home just sitting in vomit in my shoes. Like it literally got in them. Um, and it got all over me and ruined my shoes. This is a very good example of how without Understand, without understanding the needs of your users or, and listening to them, um, you wouldn't know the problems that you have in a space. If you consider New York as an open source community, I slipped in a bug. Um, and you can kind of go from there saying that, you know, one person sitting in all of New York completely empty probably wouldn't have slipped in that bug. Uh, but, you know, Node at least has experienced uh, a kind of change where we do now uh, focus on getting out of that bug and uh, listening to everyone and enabling everyone to come and participate, or at least do as much as possible in that space. So, quick recap, that was a lot of context. Don't build too much, empower your contributors, accept help along the way, take multiple approaches to communication, and be humble. How can you apply these lessons today? Four, five, not four. <laughs> um, uh, have purpose uh, in your plan and your scope. Uh, have a path to meaningful contributions. Uh, ownership leads to an unhappy place that you do not want to be in an open source community because it's not a community at that point. Uh, please communicate effectively. That's, that's one of the most vital things and it's tied into everything else here. And then finally listen enable and lift up. Thank you. <laughs>